Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. In this episode we're going to be tackling the Tamiya A-1H Sky Raider. The Sky Raider was developed after the US Navy requested that a torpedo slash dive bombing aircraft be a single seat airframe. The Navy wanted to reduce the aircraft on deck space and by merging the two aircraft types into one they'd be able to have a specialized aircraft to fill both roles. The Navy decided that the rear seat gunner in a bomber or torpedo aircraft was no longer needed because fighter aircraft were covering on most missions. Although the Sky Raider would make its first flight in March of 1945, it would not enter service until 1946, therefore missing the end of World War II. With the dawn of the jet age, the faster propeller-driven fighters from World War II such as the Mustang and the Corsair were being relegated to a ground attack role. Even though they had the advantage of speed, they lacked any protection against ground fire. In contrast, the Sky Raider was never designed for speed, but to carry a huge ordnance load into the battlefield and to be able to loiter long times before being called down on targets. How much weight could the Sky Raider carry? It could carry more payload than the B-17, the four-engine bomber from World War II. The Sky Raider was so successful in its role as a ground attack aircraft that it would remain in service for 40 years and go on to fight in Vietnam. And if a long service life doesn't convince you how successful the aircraft was, just remember that when Republic was designing the A-10 Thunderbolt, they referenced the Sky Raider and wanted to know what made that such a successful aircraft so they could bring that into the jet age. One notable event for the Sky Raider in Vietnam was when two naval Sky Raiders were responsible for the shootdown of a jet MiG-17. One of the nicknames that the Sky Raider picked up was the SPAD, which was a reference to it being a propeller-driven aircraft and looking like something from World War I, with everything having moved into the jet age. Another nickname for the Sky Raider, and one that's still used today by the United States Air Force as a call sign for CSAR missions, is the SANDY. CSAR is an acronym for Combat Search and Rescue, which means that you're expecting close contact with the enemy and to be in combat while trying to search for a downed pilot. Because of its low speeds, long loiter times, and the amount of ordnance that it could carry, the Sky Raider was the perfect aircraft to cover rescue helicopters during these CSAR missions. Often Sky Raiders would be dropping their payloads only a few hundred meters from the pilots they were trying to protect. When the Navy finally phased the Sky Raider out of service, the United States Air Force was very quick to pick up those surplus airframes and to continue using them over Vietnam. During a lighter moment in the Sky Raider service in October of 1965, to highlight the dropping of the six millionth pound of ordnance over Vietnam, the United States Navy dropped a toilet from a Sky Raider on an enemy target. In 1973, when the United States was trying to step back from its involvement in Vietnam, all the Sky Raiders that were still in its inventory were then transferred to the South Vietnamese Air Force. Some pilots in the Vietnamese Air Force continued on with thousands of hours in the SPAD as a testament to its durability in combat. One hot topic that's been on the plate now for the last couple years with the introduction of the F-35 Lightning II to the United States Air Force is that it potentially was being looked at to replace the A-10 Thunderbolt. Many people, including some viewed as critics, were calling out that there was no way that the F-35 could cover the A-10's role because the A-10 was a direct reflection of the Sky Raider with a long loiter time, lots of ordnance, and its ability to hang over target area and take a lot of punishment and still fly home. Switching gears now, let's talk a little bit about the Tamiya kit and how they've rendered the Sky Raider. In short, this kit is almost flawless, and the only criticism I really have is the lack of detail in the gear bays. To improve the look of the gear bays, what I've done is come in with some styrene and some wire just to add the hydraulic lines and the bulkheads that were missing. One of the greatest things about Tamiya's kits, especially the latest tool ones, is because you're not going to run into many fit issues, is it allows you to put a lot more energy into things like scratch building or in your weathering, painting, and things like that. I can hear the comments now where some people would say, oh, are you building Lego or are you building a model and start talking about basic modeling skills. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, if I'm used, building a kit like Revel or older Airfix, if I have to put so much effort and time into correcting issues with the kit, it just sucks the life out of it. And often by the end of that build, you just want to get it done and over with and your enthusiasm for it definitely gets muted quite a bit. The only fit issue I ran into with this Tamiya kit is the wing panel lines. And to correct that, all I did was cut the locating tabs off the wings. And then when I taped them in place, it allowed me just to move the upper wing half just a little bit to get those panel lines lined up and then just came in to glue it. And all in all, it was maybe a 10 minute setback. 
one of the things that Tamiya does really well with their engineering is where they put their join lines. And here on the bottom of the aircraft, they use the dive brake recess for where the bottom of the wings are going to mate. And there's no cleanup at all on the bottom here. The only cleaning up I had to do is along the seam after that dive brake. With the major assembly pretty much complete on the kit, it's now time just to clean up the front of the wings. And I do this just by using some 800 grit Tamiya sanding sponge and then following up with some 3000 grit sponge. This is about night three in the build, so that shows you how quick this kit goes together. Panel lines are rescribed using my JLC razor saw with a few very light passes. With the building complete, it's now time to give the model a quick wash before paint with some isopropyl alcohol, and this will get rid of any dust or fingerprint oils that are still on the kit. And noticing that I'm also not wearing gloves, so good thing I wiped that down as well. I've been asked a couple times now in the comments section to go into some more detail on how I do my painting and weathering of the aircraft, so you're going to notice this video has a lot more of a focus and emphasis on that part of the build. I'm a big fan of black basing, and the reason for that is I find that pre-shading where people just cover every panel line with a black line is a little unrealistic and is too formal slash uniform. And I prefer black basing because what this allows you to do is add some more random tones that'll show through your paint layers as you build them up. So what you do first with a black basing approach is you paint your aircraft either completely black or completely gray if you don't want a huge difference, but by adding black and whites together and adding a thin color on top afterwards, it allows you to really control the amount of wear you have on the paint. So the more paint you add, the less wear that shows through. The best thing to have before doing any type of weathering is some good reference material to work with. You don't want to do random weathering or some things that don't make sense like sun bleaching on the bottom of an aircraft. But with naval aircraft there's an exception because when they fold their wings, now parts of the bottom of the aircraft are exposed more to sun bleaching and the elements. With the color basing completed on the bottom of the aircraft, I'm now just adding some thin layers of my color I want to use on top of it. And as I build up these layers, it's going to start hiding the tone variance underneath. I know the effect's not showing very well with the gray and the white, which is what I want in this case, because this is the bottom of the aircraft. However, on the top, using black and white, that is a lot more drastic difference in tone. So you'll really see that shine through in the beginning here. I'm using a Yushi stencil set here for my black basing, but you don't need a stencil set to do this. You can just use some thin down white paint and you've seen me do this in previous videos. One mistake I did make with my black basing on this build was I used another brand of light gall gray as part of the black basing and this ended up washing out that tonal difference between the black and white. Had I just came in with my thin down color after the black and white, this effect would have been a lot more drastic on the top of the wings. With the black basing complete, you can now see me adding my thinned down main color to start covering up that black basing. It's hard to pick this up with a lighter color tone, but you can see that there's a definite depth to the paint here on the side of the fuselage with that light gall gray. One thing you read about a lot online in forums is people saying that you have to put a gloss coat or quote unquote future coat on before you do your decals, and that's not true. If you have nice smooth paint, you can put your decals right on the paint using some micro sole and micro set, or even some Mr. Mark's decal setter. I'm sure the comment section is going to set fire after making that statement, but if you do not believe me, Will Pattison has done a great in-depth review on painting deckling without gloss that I will link in the comment section, and he will walk you through that in a way much better explaining than I can. 
As always, being a mechanic and someone who loves seeing the mechanical operation of things, I liked adding some detail to my engines, and here I'm just adding some ignition wires to this big radial. With the Mustang Madness build coming up and doing three models in a natural metal finish, I decided to practice on this kit with some test pieces, and here I'm doing the radial with some AK Extreme Metal Polished Aluminum. Once I put some weathering on top of this and some panel liner, it'll draw down on that polished effect, and where it's so far back in the cowling, it won't be that noticeable anyways that that metal's a bit bright. Maybe I'm wasting my time putting this much detail into something that is going to be hardly visible, but I like knowing that I've done it and that it's there. And while we're at it, why don't we just paint the top of the push rods as well. I couldn't find any good reference photos of the firewall or the engine bay color for this aircraft, so I decided just to go with the zinc green, knowing that it was painted and produced at the end of World War II and that this was a common color in use. Sometimes you just need to make an educated guess. To wash down all those colors and to unify it, I just use a quick pass with some Tamiya black panel liner. I'm not sure what happened to the top of the cowling there, what that spot is, but I just came in afterwards with some black rubber paint just to cover that up. One thing I like to do is paint the inside of my canopies and windscreens as well as the outside because I find it gives it more of a, hmm, how can I explain this, a more of a realistic look because now it looks like there's an inner part of that frame on the canopy rather than just the outer frame. There, that makes sense. With the decals on, now I seal the paint and decals together with some gloss. I do two layers because I'm going to come in after and sand this down to level out the decals so there's no step when it comes to weathering. I add some chipping to the landing gear legs because you would have the flight deck crew constantly attaching chains to these, so there'd be a lot of dents and dings in the paint. And again, the Tamiya panel line wash brings out some of the detail. If you've ever worked around hydraulics, you know how much grease and dirt there can be. Now that the decals are on, I bust out the stencil again to add some more weathering on top of them. Unfortunately, I was a little heavy in this, and I had to come back in afterwards with a thinned down paint just to tone it back a little bit. But this allows you to tie your decals in with your weathering. Because if there's one thing I don't understand is when people weather their paint, do this awesome job, and then stick a brand new decal on top of it. I'm like, I don't understand what just happened here. Still not happy with the weathering, I decided to add in some touch-ups with some lighter paint. Also note that thick Tamiya decals settled down into the panel line with no silvering, and it was put on with no gloss coat. How did that happen? All right, I'm being kind of a jerk now. I'll stop. I think I've made my point. With the white on top of that blue, you can see how much I went a little overboard bringing in that next layer of weathering. But that was corrected down the road with some paint. When I was correcting the demarcation line between the gray and white camouflage on the wing, when I lifted the tape up, it's Tamiya tape detacked. Once again, the Vallejo Model Air Series paint bit me. It was on top of Tamiya's acrylic, and lifting that tape away, it left some black speckling where it took up the paint. Considering the amount of damage the paint on the leading edge of the wing would have from debris and from handling, it makes sense to have some paint touch-ups here. So in the end, that actually worked out well. To do my exhaust staining, I'm just building this up in very controlled layers using some very thin down paint. One reason I did the paint touch-ups on top of a gloss coat is that if I didn't like it, I could just come in with some water and a Q-tip and wipe that acrylic paint away and start again. One change I've made with my weathering is instead of putting down that big oil wash over the entire aircraft and wiping it away, I'm just putting down a little bit of oil to work with. That way I can do more layers and add a little bit more depth to the weathering. Because I already had so much tonal difference going on in the paints on this model, I decided to pass on that normal step of putting down some lighter and darker grays or off colors just to add more depth to the paint. I felt that that would have been overkill with this model.
Now that I'm happy with the panel lines and the weathering that's done, I seal everything in with two coats of flat. And the reason I'm using a flat coat is this is going to let any further oil paints stick better than with gloss where it wipes off before you can really work with it. As I stated though, you're not gonna see those oils come in for some filter dotting or whatever that's called because I already had so much going on with the paint. So I decided just to bring in some lightly thinned down paint and try to take away some of that weathering. One thing you'll see in the Facebook scale model critique group if you're fortunate enough to be there, is the hashtag fix that shit. And the takeaway from that is that it's never too late to come in and fix an issue. Here I am, the model is 95% complete. I just gotta put the landing gear on and I'm coming back in to correct paint. I've seen a few models in that group that have been stripped back down to the plastic to be corrected. So it's not too late to fix issues. Okay, so maybe I lied earlier in the video. There is a little bit of oil painting to go, and here what I'm doing is just adding the fuel stains and oil stains to the bottom of the aircraft. And I'm glad that I didn't spend any money on a resin cockpit upgrade because you can't really see it. It's very tight considering how large that aircraft is. To me, it gives you some decals for the propeller tips in this kit, but I prefer to paint them on. With the propeller going into place, this kit is pretty much complete, but to me it doesn't give you a lot of varying or up-to-date ordnance for the aircraft in this kit. Yes, you have the cluster bombs and some rockets but it doesn't give you the wide variety of things that the Sky Raider could carry. Quick segue, don't forget to drill out your gun barrels. It makes them look a lot better. So what I did for the missing ordnance is I picked up a Hasegawa kit from probably would have been the late period in Vietnam. Some of the weapons weren't correct, and the panel lines are raised on the bombs because it's an older kit from the late 80s. However, with some sanding and rescribing, you can make it look up to date. One thing that the Sky Raider was very famous for for dropping was napalm in both Korea and Vietnam. So I felt the model wasn't going to be complete unless it at least had napalm on it. This aircraft was part of a group build for a 28 day later theme and it actually took me about two weeks to build and complete the Sky Raider. The ordnance on the other hand took me about a week and a half to complete so that just shows you how well Tamiya's engineered that kit. I also extended the time it took that ordinance to be built because I wanted to add the cast texture to the bomb. Even in 148 scale, you should be able to see the casting. Plus, if you're lazy, it's a very easy way to hide any join lines or seams. Hasegawa does give you some decals for these bombs. However, where this kit's from, I think it was like 1986 it was produced, as soon as the decals hit the water, they exploded. So I just came in and found it was actually easier to paint on the yellow stripe on the bomb rather than use the decals. The rocket pods you see here are from the kit themselves, and I'm just adding the burns to the outside from where the rockets would have been fired. With the rocket pods being glued to the wings, that's going to conclude this build. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell to be notified of new videos. And as always, please leave some comments in the comment section. This isn't to inflate my ego, but to get some feedback and criticism. What do you like about the build? What don't you like? And that'll help me improve on my skills to bring you better content. I am the Model Guy, and I'll talk to you next time.